So again, I'm Alexa. I'm the Director of Community Engagement here at JET Foundation. Thank you all for joining us. Um, we're really excited for you to be here. We're grateful to our partners like Estellis for helping us make this possible and these webinars possible. I'd like to let you know who everybody is. I'd like to welcome Dr. Ha Tran. She's a Senior Medical Director and Global Medical Lead at Estellis Pharma. And then uh, Manami Arai is a clinical study manager. And then we also have Dana Edwards, who is one of our JET ambassadors, who will be helping us with the Q&A portion of this webinar today. So thank you guys so much for being here. So Dr. Tran and Manami will be um, talking about Estella's clinical trial updates for you guys today. And we're very excited to have them join us. So it's going to be pretty simple. We're just going to have a short presentation, question and answer at the end. After that, any of those that you that do want to stay, we will have a non-recorded personal perspectives portion. Um, we'll have a separate meeting link at the end for you guys to join. Um, so if you want to be a part of that, just keep a lookout for that. And then if this is your first webinar series, we do have many of these throughout the year. We usually have about one per month. So um, if you want to know more about those, please look at our website. So just so you know, the first portion of this will be recorded. So if for any reason you have to log off or have to step away, you'll be able to hear this information at a later date on our website. So just keep that in mind and we'll send that recording to you guys as well. So like I said, once the presentation is finished, we'll be answering questions. There's a Q&A box panel right in the, like it's at the bottom right hand of your screen. You can also put things in the chat. We'll be monitoring as that as well, um, but we just, we wanna make sure that we um, try to keep it as organized as possible so we get to all of your questions. So with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Tran and Malami. Thank you so much, Alexa. So I really wanted to um, take the time to thank the JET Foundation and Dana for, for having us here today. We're so grateful for this partnership and collaboration. Um, you know, it just, it means the world for, to us to be involved with, um, you know, the development process and, and listening to your feedback and hearing your feedback. So, um, you know, just I wanted to quickly introduce myself. So I'm Ha Tran, as Alexa mentioned, I'm a senior medical director here at Estella's. I'm also a board certified pediatrician and I continue to practice medicine at uh, Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. Um, on a personal level, I have three children and I'm also PTA president of my kids elementary school. So. I live and breathe children uh, just like you do. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and start um, sharing some information about our ongoing clinical study. All right, so this is a um, development program update, um, especially uh, made particularly for Jet Foundation today. Uh, and just for some disclosures. Um, the molecule that we are talking about, um, Bocidelpar, is a, um, sorry, I kept trying to, this. it's a um, investigational drug. It's not available for use outside of uh, investigation, so it's only for clinical study, and we have not yet established safety or efficacy. Um, there's no guarantee that this product will receive regulatory approval and or that it will become commercially available outside the use of um, its investigation, and it's currently not for sale um, in any um, capacity. I think um, I'm trying, having trouble removing this transcription recording. I can turn it off. That would be great. Um, I'm also having trouble with, um, okay, there we go. Um, and just an overview of um, our program and, and how things work. So as you are all aware, um, you know, the muscle is made up of um, bundles of fibers in which there are cells. And uh, the dystrophin uh, protein is um, the main reason why um, patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy have their clinical manifestation. Because when it's absent, you have um, difficulty with uh, producing energy. Additionally, um, you know, they are, the proteins are the powerhouse of cells. And cells um, have mitochondria, which enable um, energy production. Um, and again, as mitochondria are an important part of muscle cells, and the loss of dystrophin impairs mitochondrial dysfunction. So in this top figure here, you have a normal cell function in which uh, the mitochondria is able to utilize ATP appropriately for energy. 
However, uh, you know, in patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we know that uh, the dystrophin uh, impairs mitochondrial dysfunction, and in turn, um, you have a decrease in muscle function and easily fatigue uh, and have uh, issues with uh, conserving and producing energy. So our investigational drug, uh, ASP0367, is being tested to see if it can improve key um, symptoms in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So it can act inside of cells and increase the mitochondria's ability to make more energy and to uh, improve uh, muscle health and function. So the study drug is taken by mouth once a day, and it can be given in combination with other therapies, such as exon skipping therapies and corticosteroids. Um, so this is the proposed mechanism of action of the study drug. So when the study drug is uh, taken, the body sends a signal and the PPAR delta pathway is turned on. Uh, PPAR delta is a peroxisome proliferator activated receptor, which is a group of nuclear receptor proteins, and they function uh, as transcription factors that regulate gene expression. So when this drug is taken, the theory is that it turns on this gene uh, to express increased genes for the mitochondria to use more fatty acids. And when more fatty acids are used and more often, the more mitochondria is made and it uh, has an increased efficiency in order to increase the um, muscle um, health and improve its function. And because of this unique mechanism of action, it's, it's, it's um, relatively nonspecific. It can be used uh, with other therapies as mentioned before. Uh, so currently we do have a phase 1B clinical trial that's ongoing. It is randomized, it's double blind and placebo controlled. And um, again, we talked about the, the primary pur purpose is to evaluate the safety and tolerability to see how the study um, processes the drug and how it affects function. We currently have clinical trial sites uh, open and currently recruiting and rolling uh, throughout the US. So the sites are located in Los Angeles, Sacramento, California, Kansas City, uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, Minneapolis, Philadelphia, and uh, two sites in Virginia in Norfolk and um, Richmond. We do have a QR code here. I'm, I'm sure Dana would be happy to, um, or Jet Foundation would be happy to share it with you if you would like to um, look up if there is a site close to you. And um, also keep in mind that if the site is not um, close to you, there are um, taking um, referrals as well for the clinical study. So just geographically on the map, these are where the sites are, are located. And we do realize that it's you know, centralized on the East Coast and a couple on the West Coast and very few in the Midwest and we're missing the Southern region and whatnot. So um, we, we do realize that it could be uh, challenging, but again, these, these sites are, are willing to take referrals from, um, from elsewhere, even if you do not live close by. So just briefly, very high level in terms of the inclusion and exclusion criteria, we're looking to include uh, boys ages uh, 8 to 16, and, and they can be either ambulatory or non-ambulatory, um, do have a diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, regardless of the mutation type. They can be uh, taking a stable dose of corticosteroids. We do want those who are having some trouble walking quickly, um, and so that's assessed by the 10-meter walk test. Um, and then uh, we do want those, if they are non-ambulatory, to still have um, preserved uh, upper limb function. So, you know, we, we will assess that on a uh, pull test. And we do ask that the patients um, be able to move their arms to at least the shoulder height. Uh, and so that pull criteria is we're looking for a, a score of four, five, or six, if you're familiar with it. Um, and exclusionary, key exclusionary criteria that we have here are if, if um, the patient has um, any acute or serious infection, um, a mental health or behavioral problem that would prohibit them from um, being able to complete um, the, the, the study. I know sometimes it's, it's already very difficult um, for your son um, to just get by on every day. And sometimes, you know, if, if there are added stressors, it may be difficult for them to, to, to um, be a part of the study. Um, and the, the principal investigator would be the ones who would assess whether or not they're healthy enough for the study. Um, by protocol, though, we, we do ask 
at this time that the ejection fraction is at least um, 55 percent. Um, and we are excluding those with a long QT interval, if they have a pacemaker, and um, if they have um, a high biomarker, it's called a, a cardiac troponin I on lab test. Um, is that seen as is that is that seen as clinically significant by the investigator? And then um, we do allow patients to be on a stable dose of coenzyme Q, so they have to be on it for at least um, they they need to. Um, so within four weeks, they, they should not be on um, this drug. Um, they also have to have um, good enough kidney function. And then we are excluding those with um, uh, abnormal liver function as well. Um, and then if they are in a different study um, where they are receiving an investigational drug, that meaning it's not FDA approved, unfortunately, um, they would not be able to be a part of this study. Okay, and this is just a high-level high overview of what the, the clinical study looks like. So there is a, a screening period, um, which can be up to four weeks. And then the patients are randomized either to active um, study drug or placebo. Uh, and so for the first two weeks, uh, when if their patient is randomized to the active arm, then um, it, they will receive a low dose. And then um, after that, for 10 weeks, it would be high dose. So this is a 12-week period and which is double blind. After this uh, initial 12 weeks, everybody gets converted to the active study drug, um, starting off first with the two week of the low dose just to make sure if, you know, they've received placebo that they gradually get um, moved into the full dose, which is the 10-week high dose. Um, so this portion um, is 12 weeks. And then there is a, a four-week follow-up period where um, you know, safety assessments will be taken. So we are looking to enroll a total of 18 subjects uh, into the study. And we also want you to be aware that some of the visits are done at the site, and then others can be done at the, um, in the home. It just depends on the, the study site and, and their flexibility. Okay, so what happens during the study visits? Um, you know, there are different types that are um, done to assess general health, you know, the heart test with ECG and echo, breathing tests such as pulmonary function tests. Um, there are tests to see um, how your son moves his body, and that includes um, a cycling test um, for the upper limb, upper limb function. There's the um, pull assessment, the performance of the upper limb, and then a two-minute walk test if, if your son is ambulatory. And then there's also some home tests that can be done at home with an app, and we have a vendor that will help with um, this activity. Um, and then also um, you know, testing to see um, how the body is utilizing the study drug with um, blood tests and urine tests. And then um, test to see how um, your son and uh, the caregiver, you, are, are feeling. And those are quality of life surveys. And there are also some um, parent and patient interviews that will be conducted at the end of the study. Um, and a, a couple other um, tests just to um, look at function. Um, and then there, at some sites, there is uh, an MRS, uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So it's similar to an MRI that looks at the fat fraction of the, um, the leg. Okay. And then, um, you know, just uh, for your awareness, so you can reach out to Jet Foundation for this um, um, QR code. We do have a, a pre-screener tool. Um, that would be available, or you, actually, you can actually take your phone up now and, and scan it. I've actually tried it on a PowerPoint presentation. It does work. If you want to see if um, uh, you could potentially uh, be eligible, or your son could potentially be eligible eligible for this study. And there's uh, additional information here. We have we are listed on clinicaltrials.gov. We're also listed on an Estellas uh, clinicaltrials.estellas.com website, and we have. Um, uh, great patient advocacy partners such as Jet Foundation, um, where um, there are links to our uh, webinars as well. You can also uh, email our um, our own Estellas uh, um, personnel or give us a call if you have additional questions. And with that, I will stop sharing and we can um, open for any questions or, or comments. Thank you so much. Um... 
really appreciate you taking the time to, you know, tell us all, all the all of that information and educate our community. Again, if you do have any questions, you can either type it into the chat or, or into the Q&A panel box, which should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, let's see. I don't see any yet. Dana, have you seen any? No, I just had a mom ask me, um, did she hear correctly that um, they can be on a stable dose of CoQ10? And I said, yes. There you go. Is okay, stable dose. She just wrote in. Yes, I believe it could be a stable dose, but Manami, can you confirm? Oh, you're on mute, Manami. <laughs> so sorry. Well, the CoQ10 is a prohibited medication. So, oh, so I, yeah. So it looks like if you, I guess, so I think I misread that as well. So the CoQ10, you need to be off it for four weeks. I think it could have, um, I think we worry about the confounding effects of it. Yeah. So I know it's difficult. Um, some patients do not want to come to CoQ10 if it's working for them. Also, is there a potential for extending the age above 16? So that's something that we are, are, are seriously considering. Um, and you know, if we do uh, implement that, it will take uh, a few months for that to take effect because we need to get uh, IRB approval at the sites and whatnot. So um, I think um, that is a possibility. I think sometimes um, we've heard from um, some of the investigators that oftentimes the when if that we would also have to amend the poll criteria as well because oftentimes um, the boys who are um, getting older than 16 may have some difficulty there. So it's definitely something that we are um, thinking about and we can keep in touch with um, the JET Foundation if um, that's something that we will, will change. Absolutely. I think there was a question earlier today that came in from the, the pre-screen about 14 year old. So a 14 year old could um, very much uh, potentially um, be, it's, it's within the age range of, um, so. Thank you. All right. Okay, wait one second. Sure. I, I will, I will. Will you allow compassionate use for older boys? So at this time, um, you know, we have yet to establish uh, safety or efficacy data. So we will, um, we don't offer it at this time, but, you know, we will have to evaluate how things go and what the results of the, the clinical study will show uh, in order to, to potentially uh, apply for compassionate use through the FDA. But thank you for that question. Um, will parents be required to videotape? No. So we will use that application. So parents will download the application on your smartphone. And then through the smartphone video tool, uh, parents will take the video for your sons. So you don't have to have the videotape. And then, Dana, I'm not sure what the question is about every day. Can you elaborate on that one? Uh, with the videotaping, would it be they have to do the monitoring of their child uh, every day throughout oh, the 28? Not, not every day. Okay. So it just so have about a... three times during overall the study period. So one time at, at the enrollment and at the middle, and at the end of the study. Yeah, I know there are um, you know, some assessments that are um, part of our exploratory, you know, um, I think one's like some sitting to standing position and there's an, one that's like um, uh, one of your choice. So if, um, you know, the parents want to show that 
you know, my son is now um, able to, you know, throw a ball or, or something that maybe before he wasn't able to, that, that would be like just a skill that you want to show. There's a question on blood draw, um, Minami. Yep, blood draw at home will be done by the qualified home healthcare vendor nurse. So the nurse will visit your home and then take the blood draw at home. Um, is it true that my son can take Exondus or Amondus and still screen for this trial and take them together? Yes. Yes, that's true. Yeah, we, we asked that they be on a stable dose for six months. Yeah. How many trips to the hospital are required? Five, right? So yeah, roughly seven visits for the hospital visit and eight visits at your home. Okay. Um, at so, the end, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Alexa. All right, so you said ambulatory and non-ambulatory. Are you also accepting boys that are transitioning as well? Yes. So there yeah. is a walking test. And we will only allow the patients who will walk the 10 meter long walk test within oh. six seconds, right? Yep, <laughs> six seconds. Yep. That's why we so the two, two early walking patients cannot be enrolled. So it was like a early non ambulatory or non-ambulatory. So patients who cannot walk at all could be enrolled as well. I think that's what makes this a unique opportunity uh, for this trial because you're pretty much inviting everyone to have an opportunity to screen. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of boys out there that do have very good upper body strength and, and a good heart, but they're just non-ambulatory, you know? And then and then you have a nine-year-old or, or seven-year-old, eight-year-old that is walking slower, but still also has a good heart and upper body strength. So it's nice to see the inclusion being uh, pretty much all the way around. And, and by the grace of God, if you can lift the age limit of 16, that would be fantastic. Um, what drugs would not permit you to be um, in the trial? I know in the past I have I asked you about um, a behavioral drug. Is there anything else that might disqualify you because you're on it? Yeah, we do have a list. Um, so it is. Um, I have I have a list here. It's Coenzyme Q is one of them, and I apologize for the confusion earlier. Um, I'd have been on carnitine, creatine. So those are the mitochondrial focused supplements okay. that, um, you know, we just don't want it to confound the results of our studies. And then there are a few that, um, that bond with our, our drug, and those are fibrates that, or, um, that may be used for high cholesterol. Um, however, in that situation, you can talk to the investigator or the physician if you can switch to a different uh, cholesterol-lowering drug. Um, there are also digoxin, if any, but usually those patients have some um, heart failure, fexofenidine, uh, rovustatin, again, that's for cholesterol, uh, type of um, sulfa mm -hmm. drug, uh, atorvastin, again, that's the statin. Um, so we do have a, a list. A lot of it is due to um, statins and then uh, certain famotidine. That's another one, Pepsid. So that's, um, but there are alternatives on the market if that's something that um, potentially may work. So those are the, the main ones that um, would be prohibited. Do you have that list anywhere that families could go and, and see what that list is? So we do not. Um, okay. We don't have the public domain. I don't believe um, we can put it in the public domain. I think, you know, they can um, reach out and talk to the investigator and that would probably be the best way. 
And then I think, what's, the, oh, sorry, go ahead, I'm sorry, sorry. what's the primary um, efficacy endpoint? So um, the primary FQC endpoint, I would like to say that it is the, um, what are we talking Well, our primary objective is safety and tolerability. Um, and then efficacy, we are looking um, at, I know we were looking at the cycling, the six minute cycling test. So the primary objective here is actually safety and tolerability and not necessarily efficacy, but it is uh, a, a secondary endpoint for us. Perfect. No, and back and back real quick to the uh, medications, because a lot of our kids have um, anxiety, OCD, and those type of issues. So I think that falls into play when they're thinking about being excluded because their children are on a drug for their behaviors. So it's good to hear that none of those were listed. So they're not listed, but I do have to caution that if it's the behavior is... Um, you know, it could be, um, it depends on what the investigator um, assesses. Um, sometimes, you know, we, sometimes if the patient, um, you know, the child is, 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 has behavior issues or he may not want to go through with the blood draws and it may be very difficult. So, so that, that is the, the, that is probably the most um, uh, limiting factor there, not necessarily the drugs so or the condition itself, but whether or not um, it, it would be too much for for him. Right. Awesome. I don't. I don't know if you have any patient experience. You can talk about it later, <laughs> um, yeah. like after we leave. I, yeah. So I do. I do want to, you know, make sure we do leave time for that the personal perspectives portion. So if anybody does have any other questions that they do want to you know, ask Estellas, Dr. Tran, or Manami, please go ahead and send them to myself at alexa at jetfoundation.org, and we will make sure that they get to them. So um, I'm going to have Julie um, pop the link for the meeting in the chat. If you want to join us, please do. We'd love to see you there. And uh, the meeting will start directly after this. We're going to shut down the webinar and start that meeting. So thank you guys again, Dr. Tran and Manami for being here. Dana, thank you for helping with the Q&A and you know, for helping put this together. Um, we thank all of you for being here. We hope to see you at some more webinars. And again, we hope to see you on the meeting. We understand if you're not able to make it, but we really hope to see you there. So thank you guys again, and we will hop off. Thank you. Bye ladies. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.